Hello, my name is Nemanja Juric and I'm a staff autonomy engineer and tech lead manager at Uber ATG in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thank you very much for coming to my talk and many thanks to the organizers of the AV Vision workshop for giving me the opportunity to share my team's work with you today. My team is focused on perception and uh, motion prediction, critical parts of a self-driving system. And in this presentation, we will discuss some of our efforts on raster-based prediction, as well as discuss some of our novel joint perception prediction models. The work that I'll present is the result of efforts of many people at ATG across a number of teams and locations. Here, I'll list by name folks that are co-authors on the papers that we'll discuss. However, there are many more engineers, developers, scientists that contributed in one way or another from the prediction, perception, labeling, and infrastructure teams, and many others. This work would not be possible without huge efforts by all the people who contributed. A typical autonomy system processes sensor data in a sequence of modules, each taking previous modules outputs as its own inputs. At the start of the pipeline, we have sensor data entering the detection and tracking modules that infer current actor state, such as position, velocity, acceleration. Then the prediction system takes the current state and the map and is tasked with predicting behavior of the traffic actors, as well as the uncertainty of that behavior. These predictions are then ingested by the motion planning, which computes the most efficient and safe way to move the autonomous vehicle, or the AV as we will call it, closer to its goal. And finally, the ego plan is given to the control system, which provides actual hardware controls to the AV in order to execute the motion plan. In the first part of this talk, we focus on the middle part of the pipeline and discuss methods for predicting future motion of traffic actors that surround the AV. We as human drivers, we predict and quantify various possible behaviors for the actors in our surroundings. This is a critical component of the driving experience, which ensures that we safely interact with the other actors and get to our destination. The exact same goes for the AV, where motion prediction is one of the main safety critical components. For example, as shown in the figure, if we have an actor driving in our neighboring lane, we need to monitor its motion and predict how its motion might change to affect us. As soon as the actor starts swerving, we might consider an option that it will encroach into our path or that it might actually continue driving straight. Depending on the probability of each option, we need to modify our own behavior to either heartbreak or slow down a bit to prepare ourselves for the possible cutoff. Once the system is running online, we can see something like this. Every object that is tracked in the scene gets one or more predictions, covering various possible futures. We can see uh, future predictions for vehicles turning and changing lanes, as well as for pedestrians and bicyclists crossing streets. The number of factors can be very large, especially when it comes to pedestrians around the intersections, as we can see in this video. Clearly, in order to be able to handle all of them in reasonable time, we need to develop a very efficient and effective motion prediction algorithms. To help us do so, we will focus on raster-based methods, which is the main topic of this talk. Here, we assume access to a high-definition map as well as the outputs of the existing detection and tracking system. This data is highly structured and it is not immediately clear what is the best way to provide it to the learning model. Using the raster-based approach, we propose to rasterize both the map elements and the detected actors in a bird's eye view raster, thus encoding all the information about the AV surroundings into a top-down raster image. We can have separate binary masks that encode specific map elements, such as road, intersection, crosswalks, and so on, as well as a separate mask encoding the perception output, as seen in the example figures. Another approach that we adopt in the remainder of the presentation is to generate a composite RGB image that will contain all this information overlaid on top of each other. With the raster image as its input, 
one could claim that the model has nearly all the information necessary for accurate motion prediction. However, while we might be covered on the input side, we will see that the outputs of a vanilla network are not necessarily constrained, which can potentially lead to unrealistic predictions. In this talk, we will present a spectrum of raster-based methods, ranging from fully unconstrained to nearly fully constrained, as indicated by the thumbnails in the slide. Here, constraints are synonymous to priors, and the methods differ by how much prior knowledge do we introduce and attempt to enforce. We also see that constraints may come in many shapes and forms, and may originate from the model laws or the model architecture, or potentially from some hybrid approach. Let us first discuss a fully unconstrained raster-based method called RasterNet, which the other methods that we will learn, upon, uh, learn about to build upon, which was also published uh, last year at the uh, VACV conference. As we mentioned earlier, the task at hand is to predict the future actor movement and the uncertainty of that movement, given the raster image encoding the actor's context. Here, we can see a scene at the intersection where the actor of interest, colored in yellow, is making a left turn. We first generate an, an actor-centric raster image using its track state, such that the actor is located at the bottom center of the image with the heading pointing up. We can see that the map elements are encoded in the image, such as road and lane boundaries or crosswalks. The lane headings are represented in the actor-centric frame of reference using a range of colors that are encoded as a hue value in an HSV color space with uh, saturation and value set to maximum. This makes the lanes whose headings are aligned with the direction of travel more green and the lanes going in opposite direction more purple, which helps the model not predict trajectories that are going the wrong way. We can see that the tracked actor pass locations are also encoded in the image, seen as a faded trail behind the actors. Then, if we use this image as an input to a fully trained raster net model, we can see that the predicted blue trajectory is very well aligned with the ground truth to green trajectory. Note that the trajectories are predicted in the actor-centric frame, where the actor's bounding box centroid represents the origin, forward direction represents x-axis, and left-hand direction represents y-axis. To train the model, we first need to define a loss function at the prediction horizon H, where we use the L2 displacement between the ground truth XY locations and predicted XY hat locations. Assuming that the displacement comes from a half Gaussian distribution, the per actor loss is given as a negative log likelihood computed over all the horizons. Here, for each horizon H, we predict not only the XY values, but also sigma hat or standard deviation that captures uncertainty of the predicted motion. This is the network architecture. We extract the raster features using a base CNN, which can be any CNN network out there. As we have additional state inputs from the tracker, velocity, acceleration, or, and uh, heading change rate, we concatenate these three numbers with the raster features and process the concatenated features by a sequence of fully connected layers. We output two H values, correspond to x and y values for the uh, h prediction horizons, and additional h values corresponding to the uncertainties for each horizon. Commonly used metrics in the literature are average and final displacement errors. However, we also consider a long and cross-track errors, two directions in the trajectory frame, which is also called the Frenet frame. They are defined as given in the figure, with cross-track being the distance between the predicted position and its projection to the ground truth path, and the long track being the distance along the ground truth path between the projection and the actual position. To see why is it important to separate the displacement errors into these two components, we can consider the earlier example with a vehicle in a neighboring lane. If the actor continues driving straight and we make an error in the cross-track direction, that may still impact how the AV behaves as we might inaccurately predict encroachment when there is none. Similarly, amount of the long track error for the trajectory that changes lanes can make a difference between AV hard braking or slowly easing on the pedals. 
We train the model on 240 hours of data. And here we report the results of the ablation study, comparing to the unscented common filter baseline, which simply forward propagates the extra state using the estimated velocity. First, we compare the RASTMET with and without using fading to represent past states of the surrounding actors, where the state inputs are not provided. We can see that without fading or state being provided as an input, the results are worse than the baseline. However, as soon as you provide a fading, the network managed to compute its own state estimation from the raster, which resulted in improved performance of the UKF. In the interest of time, we will skip other experiments, showing that uh, more information given through tracked state helps, and that stronger base CNN networks lead to better performance. Lastly, if instead of just using L2 displacement, we use the likelihood as an optimization function, meaning that we also infer the uncertainties, we get the best results. This is due to the uncertainty downweighting the noisy examples and reducing their impact during training. We can see the end result here. The predicted values shown in blue closely follow the ground truth values shown in green. We can also see how the laying colors are changing as the actor makes the turn, which is the result of encoding lane heading in the actor's frame of reference using the HSV color space. To better illustrate the outputs of a train model, in the first figure, we can see uh, an input raster and a prediction for an actor making right turn uh, in the right hand turn in the intersection. Overlaid on top of the input raster, we can see the ground truth trajectory points shown in green and the, and the predicted trajectory shown in blue that closely follows it. Moreover, in the second figure in top right, we can see that the inferred trajectory uncertainties are also very intuitive, as the actor may move into any of the two available lanes. We can also visualize other useful and interesting outputs, such as model uncertainty and sensitivity analysis. These show that the model is quite confident in its predictions, as can be seen in the bottom left image, and that it very intuitively learned to pay close attention to the area in front of the actor as it makes a turn, as seen in the bottom right image. In the previous discussion, we only considered a single output trajectory by the model, yet we know that the behavior and traffic is multimodal. For example, actor approaching an intersection can turn left, right, or continue straight, and we need to capture this characteristic of the traffic behavior. We address this problem in the work that we introduce next. As we mentioned, the future is inherently multimodal and we want to develop a model that outputs multiple trajectories along with their probabilities. If we instead impose a unimodal architecture, even in situations where the behavior is clearly multimodal, the output may be an average of the multiple natural modes, as we see in this example. Here, we have an actor approaching the intersection in time t, where the single modal method predicts the right turn since the actor is driving in a turn-only lane. However, as the actor continues driving straight, the model gets confused and starts predicting a mix of the turning and straight modes, resulting in less than ideal prediction that goes off-road. On the other hand, the multimodal method um, would ideally handle this situation better and predict two modes, the one turning right and the one going straight, along with their probabilities. At time t, the turning probability is higher as the actor is in the turning lane, but as they continue driving, this quickly shifts to favor the going straight trajectory. So how do we say, uh, how do we train such a multi-model method? We fix the number of trajectories to some value m and use basically the same raster net architecture as shown before. The difference, however, is that instead of a single trajectory, we output m trajectories, along with their probabilities that sum to one which are initially random as the model parameters are also initialized randomly. Let us denote the ground truth trajectory as tau gt and m output trajectory as tau m. Then once we output m trajectories during training, we find which one is closest to the ground truth and incur L2 or log likelihood loss on only that one trajectory. 
here we need to define what a close actually means in order to compute the winning trajectory where we can use either a trajectory that has the smallest l2 displacement in which case mode 2 in the example would be assigned or the smallest angle with the ground truth in which case mode 1 would be assigned to compute the probabilities we assign a label of 1 to the winning trajectory and all others are assigned label 0 and then we compute the cross entropy loss between the predicted and assigned labels Finally, the total loss is a sum of the regression and the classification losses, where the regression loss is applied only to the winning mode, and classification loss is applied to all the modes. The train model is able to produce very diverse modes, which differ to some degree depending on the value of m. In this example, we run inference on the same test example using four different models, with m ranging from 1 to 4. As can be seen in the first figure, the unimodal method predicts a trajectory that is a mix between straight and turning trajectory, as you have seen in the in the uh, motivational example from the beginning of this of this um, talk. The model with m equals two separates this uh, mode into two, giving much higher probability to the straight mode. Increasing m to three, we can see that the left turning mode also appears which has assigned the lowest probability. Finally, for m equals 4, we can see that the highest probability straight mode gets split into two, the slow and fast moving straight modes. It is clear that with every increment of m, the model starts focusing on the next highest probability mode that is still not covered. However, for urban scenarios, we found that usually using three modes gives uh, reasonable results. Here, I want to show one more result that is not commonly reported in the literature and is relevant for a question on how best to benchmark and compare prediction models. The ADE or FDE results are usually reported over the entire test data. However, it might be much more useful to report these metrics separately for turning and going straight scenarios. Usually, turning scenarios cover less than 10% of the data, while we are actually most interested in those cases as that is where the interesting behavior and interactions happen, such as in the intersections. In the table, we can see that the proposed multi-trajectory predictor gives very different results on the three trajectory modes, where the turning modes usually have nearly two times larger error, as you can see in the three last columns. Note that the aggregate metric here is nearly the same as the one reported just for a straight going scenario, and the signal on the other modes is completely lost as can be seen in this column and this column. Reporting aggregate metrics over the entire test data may give a somewhat skewed view of the model performance, and it is something to consider for future research and for future competitions that are more and more common. Note that the method is uh, easily extendable with any additional data that we may have. For example, if we have uh, turn signals for the actors, we can simply provide that as an additional number to the state vector. By doing so, we can get much earlier turning predictions, as seen in the first figure, where with, with the turn signal inputs, the turning trajectory has the highest probability the entire time, which is not the case when no turn signals are provided, as, as is shown in the second figure. We have seen how explicitly modeling for multimodality improves the model predictions. However, there are many other priors and constraints in the scene that impact the motion of traffic actors. In our next work, we explore how to make use of novel gun architectures to improve the prediction performance, which was presented in, uh, at KDD 2020. We have a familiar setup and given an actor's current and past states, as well as, the, as a scene context image, we want to predict the actor's future trajectories. We want the predicted trajectories to be compliant with the row geometries in the scene, referred to as being scene compliant. For example, in this scenario, the car is unlikely to go straight into opposing lanes from a left turn only lane. And we would like to train a model that could reason about such scene compliant predictions. One way to do so is to manually define a loss that would penalize a suboptimal behavior. For example, in our earlier work, 
we use an off-road loss. It resulted in extra loss incurred when the prediction is not scene compliant. Here, we associate an actor to a lane and define as scene compliant all the lanes that follow. Then, during training, we apply a gradient that pushes all off-road waypoints back to the nearest on-road location. This already resulted in a better predicted motion. However, it does require a modeler to manually define which losses we care about. Question is, can we avoid this manual step and have the network learn the loss by itself? Many previous works try to use conditional GANs for this purpose and learn a loss that would uh, help generate realistic trajectory predictions. The generator corresponds to RasterNet using a CNN to extract features from the raster image and concatenate them with features from the actor's past motion. It then generates trajectory predictions based on the extracted features. The discriminator follows basically the same architecture as the generator. However, it takes in a trajectory um, uh, either from the generator or from the ground truth and predicts whether it is true or fake. The two networks are trained jointly with a GAN loss and the generator will learn to predict more and more realistic trajectories with the help of the supervision from the discriminator. However, there may be some important limitations with the traditional GAN based approaches. In order to combine the scene context features with the trajectories, which are represented as vectors, the discriminator needs to flatten its scene context features and concatenate them with the trajectory embeddings. Doing this will lose a lot of spatial information as the image and tra trajectory features are not in the same space, making it very hard for the discriminator to tell whether a trajectory is scene compliant or not. To address this issue, we propose a new GAN architecture for trajectory prediction called SCGAN, short for Scene Compliant GAN. SCGAN uses the same generator network as in the previous works, but with a novel Scene Compliant discriminator. This discriminator removes the discrepancy between image and trajectory representations by transforming the trajectories represented as vectors into the raster space. In particular, it uses a novel differentiable rasterizer module to rasterize each trajectory waypoint into a 2D occupancy image in a differentiable manner. This converts the input trajectory into a sequence of 2D images. We can then stack these images with the scene context image along, this, uh, along the channel dimension. After this uh, transformation, the input of the discriminator becomes a multi-channel image where map elements and predicted trajectory are fully aligned in the raster space. Finally, the discriminator network doesn't have to learn how to align images and trajectories as is required in earlier work, but simply needs to decide if this resulting image is true or fake, where we employ the, the DCGAN architecture. Next, let us discuss the differentiable rasterizer module in a little bit more detail, which trans transforms a waypoint XY into a 2D occupancy grid in a differentiable manner. For each cell in the grid, we first compute a displacement vector from the waypoint xy to the cell ij, and we call it uh, delta ij. Then we set the value of each cell as the density of a 2D Gaussian distribution evaluated at this delta ij. So you can imagine if a cell is close to the waypoint position, it will have a high density, and if it's further away, it will have a low density. The covariance of the Gaussian distribution is set as a diagonal matrix controlled by a sigma parameter that controls how widespread the densities are in the rasterized image. One important property of the differentiable rasterizer is that the gradient of each cell with respect to the waypoint coordinate xy is well defined, allowing the gradients to flow back through the cell values to the waypoint coordinates and further back. Also, note that the direction of the gradient is aligned with the direction of the displacement vector which means that the waypoint will be either dragged towards or pushed away from the cell based on the gradient values. To evaluate how the predicted trajectories are scene compliant, we first identify a drivable region for each actor, which includes the actor's current lane and the neighboring lanes. With the drivable region for each actor, we define two off-road metrics. The off-road distance metric evaluates the distance of the predicted waypoint 
to the nearest drivable region. The off-road false positive percentage metric measures the percentage of predicted waypoints that are outside the drivable region, while the corresponding route truth waypoint is inside. We compared our SC GAN model against two baseline GAN models. The first baseline does not include the scene context image in the discriminator at all, which is similar to how social GAN and SOFI work. The second baseline model flattens and concatenates the scene context features with the trajectory embeddings, which is similar to the social baguette approach. The table shows that the proposed model has significantly lower off-road errors than the baseline models. Compared to the best baseline, it reduces the off-road distance and off-road percentage by over 50%, while maintaining a similar level of L2 errors. In the paper itself, we showed that the proposed method outperforms state-of-the-art baselines when it comes to scene compliance. Here, we show some example cases where our SC GAN model has more scene compliant predictions than the best baseline. Each image represents the scene context image, and the black curves are the overlay ground truth and predicted trajectories. The first figure shows the ground truth. The second figure shows the predictions from the baseline CONCAT scene GAN and the third figure shows the predictions from our SC GAN model. The baseline is similar to previously proposed social baguette method that flattens and concatenates the scene context features with the trajectory embeddings. In this case, the actor is turning left from a left turn only lane. We can see that baseline model unrealistically predicts the actor to drive straight into opposing lane, while our SC GAN method uh, correctly predicts the left turn. We have seen that uh, introducing new losses, either manually or automatically defined, can help the model improve over the state of the art. Next, let us see how relatively minor changes to the model architecture can further improve the predictions and result in trajectories that are guaranteed to be physically realistic. As you have seen already, the state of the art raster based methods use CNNs to compute scene features, which are then concatenated with the motion features coming from the historical actor states. Then a trajectory decoder network predicts the actor's future trajectory from the feature embeddings, as done in the discussed uh, raster net. Here we treat an actor as a single point with no shape or motion constraints, and the trajectory decoder only generates the actor's future positions as xy coordinates. However, when predicting a vehicle motion, it is also important to predict future bounding box orientations. In order to do that, previous works often interpolated the future bounding box headings from the predicted positions. This interpolation may lead to inaccurate and or kinematically infeasible predictions. Here we give two examples. In the first example on the left, some small errors in the position predictions can cause much larger errors in the interpolated headings. In the second example on the right, the positions are perfectly predicted, but the interpolated headings are unrealistic because they imply a high rate of slip for the vehicle's rear, uh, rear wheel. In this work, we propose a deep kinematic model, or DKM, for vehicle trajectory prediction to address these issues. The DKM replaces the original unconstrained trajectory decoder with a novel kinematic trajectory decoder. Instead of directly predicting the X and Y coordinates of each future timestamp, the DKM predicts the future vehicle kinematic controls, which are accelerations and steering angles for each future time interval. In order to guarantee that the predictions are physically realistic, the predicted controls are constrained to be within the realistic, realistic bounds. A differentiable kinematic layer is then used to forward integrate the predicted controls starting from the current state. Because of this, the predicted uh, trajectories are guaranteed to follow vehicle kinematics. The vehicle kinematic layer computes each future state sequentially during forward integration, where each state includes position, heading, and velocity. The computations in the kinematic layer are differentiable and gradients can back propagate through this layer. 
As a result, the DKM can be trained with exactly the same loss function, functions as the previous models and requires only ground root labels on the future positions, same as previously done in RasterNet. Here we show qualitative example that demonstrates the effectiveness of the proposed model. We plotted the predicted velocity, acceleration, heading, and heading rate curves over time for an actor making a right turn in the intersection. The dashed blue curves are ground root, the red curves are from the DKM, and the other curves are from the baseline model. Note that here UM denotes unconstrained model, which is basically a raster net, which we already discussed. We can see that the introduction of the kinematic layer resulted in much smoother and more accurate higher order state profiles, which are closely following the ground truth, as can be seen by comparing the red and the blue curves. In earlier approaches, the map was used as an input or feature featured in the loss, but we did not use it to explicitly guide the trajectories. Next, I will present our work that introduces the strongest constraints so far fully using the map elements to generate trajectories that follow the map lanes and are guaranteed to be scene compliant. When it comes to prediction systems, uh, there are two broad classes of approaches used for uh, motion prediction. One is relying on the learned deep methods such as previously introduced RasterNet, and the other is using engineered heuristic based uh, algorithms where, for example, the vehicle is, uh, is assigned a lane and they follow it not unlike a train following the train tracks. Both, however, have their, have their pros and cons, where learned models are usually more accurate in the short term. But uh, for longer term predictions, the heuristic based models usually perform better. We explore the possibility of combining the two to get the best of both worlds and propose an optimization scheme to accomplish that. Let us assume uh, an, an existing system that associates an actor to the map lanes and scores the possible goal paths by the likelihood of an actor actually following that goal. Here, the possible goal paths would be G1, G2, and G3 that are directly derived from the map. We also have a goal free trajectory T parameterized by the Gaussian distribution coming from a learn model such as RasterNet. The question is how to combine the goals and goal free trajectory and obtain hybrid output trajectories that obey learned trajectory in the short term and the goal paths in the long term, where we know that they uh, perform better. Let us focus on the right turning goal and describe the method called uncertainty wear stitching that generates the stitched path S. The desired property of the final path S is that it should interpolate between the trajectory T and goal G, but preferably being closer to T in the beginning. The stitch path uh, S should interpolate between T and G until the last compatible point marked with the diamond, at which point the learned trajectory becomes too far away from the goal path G and is considered to have diverged. After the last compatible point, called the breakaway point, the stitched path S should start approaching the goal path G, finally converging fully. We achieve these desired properties by solving the following optimization problem for each waypoint on the learned path T independently. In particular, mu and sigma come from the short term learned trajectory, and pi is the projection of the solution point Y onto the goal path G. We can see that the solution point Y is the one that is likely under the learned short term distribution, while being not too far from the goal path. The parameter lambda controls for this deviation from the goal path where larger values result in larger deviation penalty. To ensure that the desired properties of the stitched path are achieved, we fix the lambda parameter to constant value until the breakaway point and increase it beyond that point until the stitched path converges to the goal path G. The resulting stitched path S is only spatial and we run a path tracking algorithm called pure pursuit on the path S to obtain the spatial temporal trajectory. The pure pursuit method models actor behavior as executing circular motion to reach a target state on the path and ensures dynamic feasibility of the resulting trajectory as the curvature and acceleration limits are taken into account during the tracking. 
the output of the tracking method is then the final output trajectory of the motion prediction module. We compare the resulting trajectory to the baseline methods, including pure pursuit that is run directly on the goal path and the learned raster net. We can see that the ground truth trajectory shown in green cuts the corner quite a lot, while the pure pursuit shown in pink is too conservative and follows the nominal path too much. Resternet, shown in blue, is very accurate in the short term. However, for longer horizons, it starts uh, outputting inaccurate waypoints that do not follow the lane well. On the other hand, the proposed teaching method, shown in black, captures the best of both worlds, a corner cutting behavior that follows the lane very well in the long term. Here we can see an interesting case with an unusual intersection not observed during training. Again, pure pursuit follows the nominal path too much, to the point that it is far from observed ground truth. Uh, Resternet outputs trajectory that goes off-road very quickly, as it never saw such an intersection during training. The proposed stitch trajectory handles the turn very well, closely corresponding to the ground truth trajectory. At this point, let us switch the gears a little bit. Thus far, we discussed a system where the detection and prediction modules are running sequentially and presented prediction algorithms that take detected objects as their input. However, we can also consider a different approach and design a system where detection and prediction are running jointly. A key component here is a deep mo uh, model that directly takes sensor data on one side and outputs object detections and their trajectory predictions on the other. This is the topic of our uh, recent work, where we presented multi-XNet model that within a single multi-stage architecture performs multi-class object detection and multi-modal motion prediction. So in the first part of this talk, we've seen that the raster-based prediction methods can achieve very good performance. Given these encouraging results, the question is, how to extend them beyond just the prediction task and solve other important problems in the autonomous system, such as object detection. There are many pros to this approach, such as end-to-end -end training of a unified perception prediction model. This can also lead to a simpler onboard system, system as now we have a one machine learning model instead of two running on a car. There are, however, some downsides to this idea, as the model is inherently more complex and could be more difficult to train and analyze. Let us see what we actually want to achieve with the, with the multi accent model. Going from the sensor inputs, the goal is to detect objects in the AV surroundings, infer their states, and finally predict their future trajectories and uncertainty of that movement. Here we illustrate how that looks in the real world. So starting from the sensor data, the model infers object detections, as well as their future motion, and the motion uncertainty. The model takes the sensor data from a large area around the AV and can handle very complex scenes. It can also handle various extra types, such as vehicles, pedestrians, and bicyclists, and infer their multimodal predictions. Here we see how we predict a low probability of turning trajectory for an oncoming vehicle actor. And while unlikely, it is still possible to observe in the real world when we drive for millions and millions of miles. Capturing such a low probability events is critical for ensuring safety on public roads so that these stale events can be taken into account by the motion planning in order to modify ego velocity and better anticipate these potential futures. Let's take a look at the architecture that allows for processing of sensor inputs in order to obtain the intended outputs, uh, the detections and the predictions. The LiDAR and MAP are each represented in the bird's eye view uh, representation, which we'll refer to as BEV, and then separately rasterized and processed before they learn features are combined in a common top-down frame. Given these features, each grid cell then votes for object detections and their unimodal predictions, which completes the first stage of multi XNet. Once we have the first stage detections, we found that it is beneficial to perform a second stage refinement aimed at motion prediction, where we crop feature map around a detection 
and rotated, so the heading is pointing up, which is commonly referred to as a rotated region of interest. Note that the predictions from the first and second stage can both be used in the final system, depending on the latency requirements. For example, because the second stage predictions incur additional latency cost, the system can use the first stage predictions for some actors and only run the second stage for actors where this refinement is deemed important. The loss we optimize is a combination of detection and prediction losses, computed differently for background grid cells, where there are no labeled actors, and for foreground cells, which contain traffic actors. For T0, we predict exist existence probability of an actor, as well as their position, width, length, and heading. While for the future timestamps, we assume the shape to be constant and infer just the positions and headings. We also downweight losses further in the future by the constant lambda that is in the zero one range in order to focus on the short term, more relevant horizons. A specific focus of our work was, uh, was on designing an uncertainty aware loss that would capture location uncertainty of actor motion. Here we consider ideas along several dimensions. First, we decompose the predictions in their along track and cross track components, motivated by the discussion on the importance of these directions from the beginning of this talk. Then we consider the assumptions of Gaussian versus Laplace noise, and finally consider two different uncertainty aware losses, negative log likelihood and KL divergence. When it comes to the KL divergence, we defined a ground truth uncertainty with zero mean and diversity B, which is linear in the time horizon T and controlled by fixed parameters alpha and beta. These are separately defined for a long track and cross track, but as an example here, we just uh, give the along track or AT equations. Then we can minimize the KL divergence between this ground truth and inferred noise model. While it might seem unusual that we defined a ground truth noise model and used it as a part of the loss function, this actually acts as a regularizer. And we'll see that the empirical results validate this choice. We compared our method to other state-of-the-art end-to-end methods, such as SPA-GNN and two versions of IntentNet using an open-sourced new since dataset. As detection and prediction is performed simultaneously, we computed metrics on both tasks and reported average precision on one side and displacement and cross-track errors at three seconds on the other, using top one as well as top three result for the multimodal method given in the parentheses. While the detection performance is roughly the same, we can see that our architecture outperforms the other approaches across various actor types. We also provided a detailed ablation study of various parts of the architecture, including uh, inclusion of uncertainty aware loss, second stage of the architecture, and multimodality modeling. In the interest of time, uh, I just want to point out an interesting result that our choice of KL divergence and the Laplace distribution on one side over negative log likelihood and the Gaussian distribution on the other resulted in the best prediction numbers. One downside of the approach that we just discussed is that it leaves a lot of information on the table as it is fully focused on the LiDAR data and BV representation. Addressing this issue is a topic of our next paper that was recently published, which proposes multi-view fusion of multi-sensor data. Note that this model extends the, uh, the existing multi xnet architecture by introducing additional processing of uh, sensor data in range view, in addition to the existing BEV processing. As we mentioned before, there are many sensors on board the self-driving vehicle that we can use as inputs to our perception and prediction models such as LiDAR, camera, radar, and others. Moreover, the raw sensor data can be projected and represented in many ways. For example, we've already discussed the bird's eye view representation in a lot of detail in the context of both uh, RasterNet and MultiXNet. But there are also other feasible representations such as uh, range view or camera view. Then in order to improve the performance of our models, we can try to combine and fuse all these varied information. And the question is how to go about this. This is, of course, not a new problem. 
and there are several ideas proposed in the literature revolving around early or late fusion of sensor data or anything in between. In this paper, we considered a middle ground and proposed to use LiDAR to match uh, range view and bird's eye view features before continuing with the BEV based detection and prediction as discussed earlier in MultiXNet. In the next few slides, we discuss this approach in more detail before presenting the comparison of the proposed method with the other state of the art. In this work, we focus on using camera inputs as an additional sensor signal, although the proposed approach is applicable to other sensors as well, such as radar. In particular, in addition to BEV representation, we also represent the LiDAR data in its native LiDAR range view, as shown in the top figure, which is then processed by a number of convolution layers to obtain learned, learned uh, LiDAR-based range view features. In parallel, we also compute separate camera-based features. This is done by fir first processing the camera data in the native camera view using a sequence of convolutional layers, similarly to how the range view LiDAR data was processed. Then the learned camera features are projected onto the, into the LiDAR range view by matching LiDAR points with the pixels in the camera view to obtain camera-based range view features. Here we illustrate how the matching between LiDAR points and camera is performed. We can see that the LiDAR data is projected onto the camera image and a range view feature map is then generated by warping the existing camera view feature map according to the correspondence between the LiDAR points and camera view pixels. The final range view feature map is illustrated in the bottom figure. Next, uh, LiDAR and camera based range view features are concatenated, processed by a shallow convolutional network, and finally projected into the BEV representation, the same one used in MultiXNet that we previously discussed. The projection from range view to BEV, bird's eye view, is again performed using the LiDAR point correspondence, since each pixel in the range view is matched to exactly one pixel in the BEV grid. This completes the description of the new multi-sensor multi-view extension to the original multi-exit multi model. Let us see how the final architecture looks like, which we refer to as LiDAR camera multi-view or LCMV for short. We can see that the core architecture marked in red is borrowed from multi -Xnet, where we process LiDAR and map data in BEV representation and send the final feature map to the multi -Xnet backbone that performs detection and prediction in the first and second stage, as we previously discussed. In addition, we also process LiDAR and camera in a range view before projecting the features to BEV, as discussed in the last few slides. The final range-based BEV features are then concatenated with the original BEV features coming from MAP and LiDAR, and then together sent to the multi xnet backbone for further processing. Let us see how does performance of the new model compare to the existing state of the art. We first use an in-house ATG 4D dataset to compare the new model to the baseline MultiXNet that does not have camera inputs or any range view processing. We can see that LCMV is better across the board, which is not surprising given its additional inputs. It is interesting that detection performance measured by average precision, precision is better for all actor types, including vehicles, pedestrian, and, uh, and bicyclists, with the large, largest improvements at uh, longer ranges. Interestingly, the prediction performance, measured by displacement error at three seconds, uh, has also improved, with the exception of bicyclists, which can be explained by a smaller data size, resulting in a more noisy numbers. We can also see that uh, such improvements uh, come at a, at a latency cost due to additional processing, where uh, for the ATG 4D data set, the latency increased by nearly 25%. Next, we use the open source uh, new scenes data set to compare LCMV to the state-of-the-art continuous fusion model that also uses camera inputs, as well as to the uh, multi-view model that only uses LiDAR input in the range view, referred to as LMV. Again, we can see that the proposed LCMV uh, model outperforms the competing methods across the board, and especially for vehicle and pedestrian actors. 
when it comes to bicyclists, we saw some mixed results, which can be explained by a very small number of bicycle examples in the data set, similarly to the ATG 4D results from the previous slide. Let's take a look at some interesting uh, qualitative examples comparing MultiXNet to LCMV model. Here, a uh, red color indicates false negatives, where a method fails to detect uh, an existing actor. We can see that uh, MultiXNet missed two vehicles in front of the AV that are heavily occluded by the parked vehicle. However, LCMV managed to retrieve these vehicles, despite such, uh, such high levels of occlusion. This is another example where the proposed uh, model improves over the baseline. Here, MultiXNet fails to detect both the occluded faraway vehicle, but also the occluded pedestrian, which can be observed in the zoomed in crop. LCMV, on the other hand, detects both actors, leading to better performance and improved safety of the AV and the surrounding actors. We have come to the end of this presentation. It is clear that uh, motion prediction is one of the most critical modules of a deployed AV system, and raster-based methods have shown state-of-the-art performance on a variety of problems. We have seen that raster-based deep methods can be successfully combined with prior knowledge about the motion prediction problem, including map and mo uh, motion constraints. In addition, joint end-to-end -end detection and prediction show, uh, methods show uh, very promising results, reducing system complexity and improving performance and latency, and overall latency. While the performance of the approaches has improved significantly over the past few years, with many groups contributing great work and ideas, a lot more remains to be done. For example, better reasoning about the surrounding context and interactions is needed, and better sensor fusion approaches and processing of the already existing data, among the other things. I'm truly excited about many recent publications, workshops, and conferences that are pushing the state of the art and are bringing us all together to jointly solve the autonomous puzzle. And I'm looking forward to what the future may bring to the field. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please reach out by email or on LinkedIn, and I will be more than happy to connect and further discuss these interesting topics. Thank you very much.